and welcome to this evening's virtual event with Brookline Booksmith, celebrating 50 outstanding years of Agni Literary Magazine. I am Lisa Gozashti, a co-owner of Brookline Booksmith in Brookline, Massachusetts. If you're familiar with our store, thanks for returning to us tonight. If this is your first time here, we're so happy to have you with us. And we're so grateful for your support of Agni and our independent bookstore through your attendance tonight. We hope you'll enjoy the conversation to come. And now Shuchi Saraswat will introduce our wonderful panelists. Thank you all so very much. Thank you, Lisa. Um, and thank you to Brookline Booksmith. Uh, my name is Shuchi Saraswat and I'm Agni's associate editor. As Lisa mentioned, this year we are celebrating our 50th anniversary. Um, for, those, for those of you who are new to us, Agni is a literary journal that was founded in 1972 by Ukrainian-American writer Askold Melnichuk, and it is now co-edited by Sven Burkertz and William Pierce, who have been together at the helm for 18 years. We publish two issues a year, and each is 248 pages of poetry, fiction, nonfiction, hybrid work, and art, and we just published our 95th issue. Online, we maintain an active blog, review section, an interview section, and most recently, thanks to our founding editor's efforts, we've been publishing a series of dispatches from Ukrainian writers. While the magazine is housed in the basement of the English department at Boston University, our editorial team lives all over the country. So this series is really meant to bring together our editors and our global family of readers and contributors. For each of these conversations, we've asked one of our editors to invite a writer whose work they feel in some way represents Agni's shifting, evolving aesthetic. Our first conversation was at the end of April with co-editor Sven Burkertz and writer Joan Wickersham. And tonight we bring you our second installment with poetry editor Jessica Q. Stark and poet Shang Yang Fang. Shang Yang Fang grew up in Chengdu, China and composes poems both in English and Chinese. After completing his degree in civil engineering at University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, he became a poetry fellow at the Mishner Center for Writers. A recipient of the Joy Harjo Poetry Award and the Gregory O'Donohue International Poetry Prize, he is the author of the collection Rearing the Mountain, which includes his poem Meditation on an Authentic China, first published in Agni 94. He's currently a Wallace Stegno, Stegner Fellow at Stanford University. Jessica Q. Stark is poetry editor of Agni and has been part of the editorial team since 2019. She's the author of Buffalo Girl, which is forthcoming from BOA editions in 2023, Savage Pageant, which was published in 2020, and four poetry chapbooks, including in Annette. Her poetry has appeared or is forthcoming in Best American Poetry, Pleiades, and Glass Poetry Journal, among others. She is an assistant professor of creative writing at the University of North Florida. Sheng Yang and Jess, thank you both so much for being here. I'm gonna pass this off to you. Thank you, Shuchi. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, Jessica. Hello, it is um, it's my great honor to be here. Thank you everybody for tuning in. Um, and thank you, uh, Shang Yang, for spending time with us and for celebrating our 50th anniversary year. I think you and your work are perfect interlocutors to think about the wide trajectory of poetry and what it can do for us now and what it can do for us mm -hmm. in the future. So thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Well, you're welcome. All right, I just had the, the pleasure of reading finishing your, your latest debut book um, called Bearing the Mountain, and it's absolutely stunning, gorgeous. When did it come out? What month? It's very it came out uh, last October, right at the time when I was doing a COVID test at Shanghai International Airport. Um, so I have no time to celebrate it, but anxiety at the time. <laughs> well, it's absolutely stunning. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous debut and I just put in the chat a link to purchase from Copper Canyon if you're interested at any time um, throughout this conversation or after. Um, what I what struck me about the poem that we accepted for issue no, number 94 
um, which I'll have you read in just a moment if you're willing, because it's such a, such a beautiful, stunning piece of this collection. Um, but what I, I love, love about to. that poem, yeah, okay, um, thank you. What I love about that poem and what I love about your book writ large is um, this kind of restlessness, I guess, of its, its speaker, its wanderer, who is, and I'd love to hear your ideas about, you know, how you approach speaker and perspective, but I just mm. found your speaker so flitting, so mobile, unreliable at some time, sometimes a little bit sneaky. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely um, unreliable. I agree with that, especially in the meditation of an authentic China poem, the speaker oh. is in tended to be unreliable yeah Fantastic. yeah but then also you know even that is restless because what i was just stumbling again and again in this whole collection was just these intense moments of profundity um and these intensely erotic moments that were unabashedly queer but also very cold mm -hmm. <laughs> in some ways yeah i um, agree and I'm, I'm leading up to a question, but I'm just I'm just trying to be as representative of the awe that I have of your work. Um, but the combination of words that I kept coming up with throughout sitting down with your book and your poetry is beauty and potential ruin, <laughs> like mm. simultaneously. That That's I felt beautiful. Like often sitting at the apex of how you describe an object or an image or a place, there was always this like threat of complete collapse. You mentioned the void, you mentioned nothingness. Um, yeah, and I'm, I, I was also really struck by kind of these persistent liminalities throughout the book, kind of like protracted arrivals or the threat of disappearance mm -hmm. or eradication. Um, so anyways, I'd love to start us out with um, your thoughts on your own arrival as a poet, your arrival to the creation of this beautiful book, um, perhaps your arrival to your first poem you ever wrote, um, wherever you want to pick up those questions, I'd love to hear your response. Oh, absolutely. Well, that's that's huge, a huge question. Um, I mean, this book for me, uh, in short, I think it's a doorway for for me to, you know, perform an escape from myself, from my past and from my um, experience. Uh, it, it, I think the book mainly function in imagination. And that's why I picture it as a way to escape myself instead of ex expressing myself. But in terms of the first poem uh, I wrote, that was like 50 years ago. Um, I started writing in Chinese when I was in China. I started re reciting, memorizing Chinese classical poems, but not until really I, in my middle school, I read uh, Garcia Lorca's poem and uh, Georg Trakl, Osip Mandelstam, uh, Anna Akhmatova, and those poems just really just opened a new world for me. And I couldn't understand what's happening. For example, the Lorca poem, "Green, how I love you, green, green wind, green branches, the boat, uh, the horse in the mountain, the boat far out uh, on the sea." I mean, and that just truly transformed the way I see poetry and see the world. And I started imitating them in Chinese, reading Chinese translations of those poets. And then I came to the United States when I was 17, uh, not able to speak English at all and tried to write in English, relying on Google Translator. Mm -hmm. And I would write in Chinese and then translate my poems into English. And it's a habit I still do now. Uh, I don't rely on it anymore. I have to show my English is kind of competent, but I still do it out of habit. Um, but uh, I mean, then I met so many great teachers. I did civil engineering. I studied with my first mentor, uh, Bridget Pecantelli, who mm -hmm. just encouraged me to continue writing, even regardless, I mean, my English was broken at the time. But she said, just keep writing. And, 
and that's how I started this book. And I started writing in English when I was a sophomore in Illinois. And that's how the whole journey begins. Um, yeah. Wow. I love that you mentioned Garcia Lorca in, as an influence. I, I read so much Garcia Lorca in your work. <laughs> <laughs> I love Lorca. He's my prince. He's my prince in poetry. Yeah. I uh, I did a my master's thesis in Spain, and I I did it on Lorca. Um, oh wow! It, it was very close to my heart. Um, but I definitely witness a lot of the Lorca in here. Just this kind of attention to an almost confrontational erotics of language um, mm -hmm. that I noticed throughout. Um, I re there was one line in your book, um, I, I believe it's in the poem that you're going to, but by me, I am a product of your estranged wanting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. oh my gosh, that's brilliant. <laughs> but I, I, I just felt like Lorca. Um, yeah, and I, I want to talk a little bit later about specifically that poem and how it works through yeah. kind of upended forms of desire. Um, mm -hmm not only of like an, an erotic desire, but of course, consumerism, consumption. Um, but before we do that, would you mind reading, reading the poem? Oh, absolutely. Um, I just warned the audience, it's a very long poem. It will probably take uh, 10 to 12 minutes to read, um, I, but I would love to read it. Um, Wonderful, I'm just yes. gonna... I would love to just share also the gen with the audience the genesis of this poem. We read so many poems um, at Agni together and we get so much wonderful work. Um, and I've been on a few editor panels and I always get the question, you know, like, well, what is it? What are you looking for? Um, and it's one of the most difficult questions to answer. And there's a lot of poems that fall, you know, in a, in a sort of liminality, or we have a long convert, protracted conversations about a certain poem before we accept it, or we argue tastefully about um, specific poems and pieces. I will say that this poem, um, there was no argument to be had. <laughs> we, it was, uh, we were much in consensus, and I will say that is a, a very rare feat. I, um, I came across it, I was enamored with it. I texted everyone on the board immediately. Um, they were enamored with it. So all to say, I just want to sing your, sing your praises um, and how interesting and unique um, this poem is. The way I do answer that question though, in terms of what are you looking for is something that I think I share with um, some of the other poetry editors, which is um, that it's unique, that it's fresh and that it feels urgent like really big emphasis on that last word. And I just felt like this urgently needed to be out there. And I think its length and its excess is a part of the material um, of that urgency. So I just wanted to preface um, your reading with, um, you know, the kind of experience of it on the other side, which I'm not sure if it was shared with you. So I want to use the space to do so. Then thank you. And I also want to add that this poem, I thought it were, uh, before the book came out, I thought it was never going to be published anywhere because of its length, because of the <laughs> material, how kind of difficult material that is to dealing with. And it's very strange. It's just a very strange poem and loquacious. Um, but I think the last um, teacher that I had, Paisley Recto, after reading this poem, she said, you should send it to Agni because that poem has been circling around and being rejected for two years. And Paisley said, wow. it's wonderful, send it to Agni. And immediately by magic, Agni took it. Oh, and funny. I was just so, so grateful. And um, just for the vision and trust from the editorial part. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm going to, while you're reading, I'll um, be sharing my screen um, with a copy of the poem so you can read along. I'll also pop in a, um, a link to, um, PDF, if you're curious. Just give me one moment. Okay. I wonder if you could zoom in a little bit. Yeah, thank you. 
Wonderful. So I'll start. Meditation on an authentic China. I'll be rude since there's no proper name to call such an ill-mannered thing. Its varnished skin resembles nothing but a porcelain vase. I call it China. I call it China though it was manufactured in West India or Venezuela or any third world country by a child's hands muddied in a makeshift workshop beside a brushwood door with a child's dog, not his pet, his dog chases a lime butterfly. Let us call the dog, the, the child, the artist, and his dog, the guardian of art. Nevertheless, the child must report a failure in his artistry. Painted with lanky figures dressed in blazers and two limousines shuffling beneath the street lights of fruit, he calls it China. Perhaps it portrays the child's dream of the first world. But where is the orchid? The lantern, the rice paper fan unveiling the face of a vermilion girl whose hair must be pitch black, whose eyes must be filled with tragedy. Is it true that through tragedy were cleansed and transfigured the way a stone is honed into a jewel? The stone remains a stone, crystal and uncut. The child is still a child in his village. While we, transformed by our love of commercials and shop windows through which we dream of the dreams dreaming of us, are as foreign and real as a man drinking whiskey on a camel in the Kalahari. Lavender scented shampoo suggests a well meaning civilization. Each night, I civilize my pitch black hair. Buy me, I'm a product of your estranged wanting. Exchange me, I am a wanting myself, estranged by your wanting, which is a product of the promulgating posters in the street where winter is as real as communism. Though the China is in truth real and authentic, it seems less real for being not at all what you imagined. Your China is more beautiful, more or less, like the jar atop a mountain in Tennessee, like nothing else in Tennessee. You, after all, are the artist. The child, a product of your artistry, fails to fulfill your vision. The child is the China he made, invested with false dreams. None of us will meet the child who wrings his muddied hands. None will know his name. His name is who? Because who cares about who? Not even his parents who left that southwest village to secure migrant jobs at a Shanghai construction site where the company provides no insurance, but thank God offers daily set payment. They'd buy two yuan steaming hot baozi and soy milk from a tricyclist at 5 a.m. just before the pouring of concrete and pay a little extra because the tricyclist's daughter was diagnosed with leukemia a month ago. And that reminds them of their son and daughter whom they have promised a brighter future. And that's why they took the three-day train to Shanghai and worked through the night disowning their present. So for who? His government is his grandfather's walking stick, his religion, his sister's braided hair, which swings like a pre-autumn bulrush. Each day, he'd walk behind her red-banded pendulum for an hour and a half past the creek of dead reeds, past the bamboo alley to his school, which he'd usually skip and sneak into a kiln run by a local merchant who, too, has promised him daily settlement so he can buy a blue hairband for his sister, for blue is his favorite color. The shade of his mother's overwashed apron and of his grandfather's silhouette when he chugs cups of home brewed sorghum wine like a raggedly by in the yard where they have planted medicinal herbs and camellias. How everything loses its hues in the moonlight into deliquescent blue. Such beauty, such stillness echoing eternity is only a quarter inch from death which will come in less than two years when his father falls from the 17th floor, a cheekbone pierced by two rebars, legs strapped into the freshly finished concrete slab, creating an abstract that robust pattern of blood so ravishing that his son is powerless to paint it on his porcelain. Without testaments, history is no more than a buried legend. Years later, when the boy's name is mistaken for who, instead of asking who is who, we might ask ourselves who is who? And instead of claiming who is real, we might ask who is real? What is real here is the solitude of the China, of not being understood by you. 
Its gaping rim doesn't utter a word of frustration. Maybe this is a sign of suppression of suffering long under the regime of dictatorship. A valid premise, for on the China's neck there's a dash of red, which must be evidence of communism, which is likely another hypocritical, excuse my English, hypothetical scenario assembled by dream and out of the infected collectiveness of any dream's naivete, the argument proceeds. Do the child's bruised hands confer him a certificate as an ideal citizen purchasing dreams from the nation's vending machine, or is to be ideal to have a self smashed, a mind stout as the hooped meat in the butcher shop, readily minced for consumption, while still being convinced that with the stem of daffodil, one could burn down the castle? Since when do these dreams chosen out of desire subjugate our reality? Or is it true that reality is so sharply palpable that we need a collective fantasy to mitigate it? Convinced by what we believe, we see with astral eyes which situate us in an idealized world through which each of us becomes the object of our own imagination, glamorous and possibly free, authentic for sure, because some of us are by others then desired even momentarily in this glorious catnap of democracy. If to be authentic is somehow to be partly true, which in certain circumstances means to be naked and undisguised, then the nakedness is not of the body, but in our eyes. Tragedy enters when reality breaches the dream, which luckily occurs to none of us, nor to the child whose miseries seem no grander than a situation comedy. Because rather than dream, we are granted dreams. Rather than dreaming, we are granted dreams. Even the dead refuse to wake up from them. Someday, our grandfathers dressed in chanterelles and moss will fall into awakening and ask if communism has ultimately been realized if the red flags have taken root like the crab myrtle in a childhood backyard, not the dynasties of the rice wine of imminent ecstasy or the ink wells stilled to instill a possible masterpiece of calligraphy. The bamboo flute is buried beside the pear blossoms that shred like broken snow. Anyway, it snowed briefly yesterday. Today, when Hugh is dragged to the flea market in the East Village of Lower Manhattan by his mother, who, wa who wants to celebrate his success, for yesterday he got an acceptance letter from Princeton, where he will spend the next four years perfecting his craft in art and sculpture and stuff. It comes across this china made by Hu and found its cheap enamel with its slim, translucent fingers, well preserved by Patagonia mittens and locks and tin hand cream. The porcelain burns his palms with the same temperature as the winter sun. His mother would like to have, like him to have this modest token, but he's in a hurry. He's decided to indulge his jubilances among his friends. His friends are calling. They're on their way to Linguini with shrimp scampi and some illicit beer for one kid is the nephew of the restaurant owner. He knows his way to the cellar and his way to pleasure. While Hugh is holding hands with his girlfriend under the table, he can't erase from his mind the china whose coarse coatness leaves his hands unscarred. Hugh didn't accept the gift. He doesn't need it. Hugh does not need to be validated by any object. No, he doesn't need to prove himself real or conform to our imagined version of him and by doing so, be made more beautiful. Hugh is beautiful. His tipsiness paints a delightful blush. He will not return home for dinner, though his mother has cooked him his favorite ribs and mushrooms stippled with asparagus which he would never touch until he would, after he fills her coffin with petals of his choice, primrose, iris, camellia, and snowdrop in early November of that same year, he will continue to hunger, continue to want and wander about whose China, whose ghastly craftsmanship and unrefined sensibility will continue to startle him like the screech of a blackbird shot through the midnight blue. 
though Hugh will never know why. He will return to the flea market each Sunday and he will never find the China, not even a fragment. And he would look at his palm and imagine his touch has become its last remains. And who will return to his rancid creek and hopeless village, to his desolate and cold noodles and the tombs of his father and of his sister who died giving birth to a daughter whose first name is I, which means love, Pew, and who will continue to return to find grief, find loss and inspiration that unknots this fabrication of self. And we will follow them. We will try to return to where we came from and fail not because the landscape has been reassembled by factories or the early dreamscape has vanished into the misty air, preceding our tragic return. And having returned, we find we were never there. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And thank everyone for listening, uh, suffering the way through it. No, no. I think it's, um, as of late, I've just been very enamored with um, the unabashedly long poem. And I love the, ex the excessiveness of this. I mean, could you talk to me a little bit about... And first of all, thank you for reading such a long piece. It's like, and I will say my cat is very responsive to music. And whenever, uh -huh. there's, a, whenever there's a very good singer on, she starts like meowing and gets really worked up. And she got very worked up during your reading. So oh, brave reviews wow. from Kiki the cat and myself. Well, thank you. Um, I would love to know how long did it take you to craft this poem? Was it you know, a labor of love. It's like, uh, there's just so much to unpack in this. And I just would love to hear the story of this yeah, poem. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, this poem, before this poem, I never considered myself would write anything um, uh, political in this unabashed way. I, um, but this poem, shall I tell the story? It's not a very yeah. pleasant, story though. Uh, so after my engineering, this poem I wrote during my first year uh, in, uh, in studying for an MFA. So it was five years ago. And at that time, I just graduated from the engineering school and everything about the poetry community is new to me. So one day there was a famous white editor coming to our program mm -hmm. and looking at my work and in uh, whether unconsciously or consciously in a condescending, encouraging way um, and asking me to write more about, you know, saying, write more about your mother. Tell us more about your mother. <laughs> Tell us more about your immigration story. What is it like being gay in China versus United States and, right. and everything like that. And then I, I, at that time I was writing about um, China, about my culture, about, but it just doesn't look like the China mm -hmm. he has imagined. It's, mm -hmm. it's not Chinese enough for him. Right. And I also remember there's also another poem in my book. It was half in English and half Chinese. It's a musical piece. It's basically a composition for the love of two language. But then the, the editor said that I was imitating Israel Pound for using my own language. <laughs> um, I know. And at that time, uh, I was so confused because this whole world was new to me. So I started thinking about authenticity. What is it like uh, a China? What is a China uh, from his view, from uh, the Western gaze and from my point of view? And I started thinking about it. And so that's why in, in the beginning of the poem, there are lines um, that are like, um, but where is the orchid, the lantern, the rice paper fan unveiling the face of a vermilion girl whose hair must be pitch black, whose eyes must be filled with tragedy. But at that point, I feel if the poem just stayed here, it would be such a, you know, liminal poem. It does right. not have anything um, substantial in it. I don't want it to be in an angry poem or anything, but 
immediately I started thinking about two questions, uh, which is the imagination of China, it's the, the Western gaze exoticizing this idea of China, but also the Chinese people fantasizing their own country through the channel mm -hmm. of propaganda of their government. Mm -hmm. And as I was thinking about these two points, and I think in my poetry, I always take the stance which is an, a, a, against, uh, is the kind of oscillating argument through things. And I, as I was taking these two, the later part of the poem kind of informs me as I was writing the poem informs me, but this is not the only uh, perspective you should think about, but also the people imagining its country, but also the country, how does the country imagines its people? What is it like to be an idealized citizen in different countries? I, and what's the cost of it? I mean, I have seen my friends who are in China being invited, there's a metonym for it, being invited for a cup of tea, which is to be investigated or imprisoned by the police. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and, and that, that is how I, the poem informs me the strand, the thread, how it goes. But I did craft it for years. I wrote it for my MFA three years. Um, I, the first draft happened in my first year. And at that time it was mainly uh, abstract uh, discussion, uh, rhetorical statements and uh, hypothesis of different scenarios, but it was too abstract. I showed it to my uh, teacher, Roger Reeves, and he looked at it, he said, oh, you should read Robert Hass's poem. Um, I am your waiter tonight and my name is Dimitri. And that, that's a line from John Ashbery also. And I, at that time I was influenced by Ashbery. So I read it and it was a masterpiece. I recommend everyone to read it and don't return to this poem of mine because that's a masterpiece. This is a whatever piece. So that poem really inspired me to really talk about the idea in the form of narrative instead of just arguments. And adding one narrative, I thought it's done and it's been in my closet for two years, two more years. And I started sending it out and never get response. And then Paisley read it. Paisley recommended to add another storyline, which is the storyline of Hugh at the end of the poem. So I wrote that immediately, uh, probably two months before I submit my fi final manuscript to, to Copper Canyon, uh, the, the book manuscript. And once I finished writing the part of Hugh, uh, after two minutes, I, I send it to Paisley. Paisley said, send it to Agni, and I send it to Agni. And that's the whole lifetime of, of this poem, but it really took a long, long time uh, because the difficult for me at that time, I did not have that capacity or vision to fully handle the materials that I was working with. Uh, so it really took time for me to understand what I'm working with and um, to finalize it. I think what I mean, what I'm, what I find so intoxicating about this poem is its disobedience, though, and I feel mm -hmm. like that's such a resonating, even that thread of rage that you mentioned um, in response to a white gaze. I feel like that disobedience is so important. And I'm having in the back of my mind that quote from um, Rachel McGibbons, the poet, who said, um, when wickedness is disobedience, it's mm. revolutionary. When wickedness is indulgence of the powerful, it becomes a tool of oppression. And I feel like yours is, is, is it's disobedient. And you know, it's we're back to that unreliable speaker. Um, mm -hmm even the flitting movement of who with the, you know, H or WHO slippage. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I love that disobedience and I feel it's so resonating in that first line of- I'll be rude. Yeah. I'll be rude. <laughs> I'll be rude, which is also, you have such a way with um, doubling, you know, mm -hmm. paying attention to the doubling of, of meaning of 
doubling of images, doubling of representation, all of this kind of doubling that has in accumulation has such a revolutionary effect in my mind. Rude being, of course, something that can be defined as something that's offensively impolite or mm -hmm. bad mannered, but also something that's startling. Yeah. And abrupt. Yeah. I feel like that is that is this poem. <laughs> that is, yeah, that is, that, that is the against, and I'm thankful that you publish a poem starting with I'll be rude. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And I just want to uh, mention to the audience, if um, you have some burning questions, I, I invite you to share some of them in the Q&A box at the bottom. Um, I'll probably spend the last 20 minutes taking some questions um, for our lovely poet. So please um, feel free to weigh in if you have any questions pop up for you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, sorry, were you going to say something? No, I mean, I just probably clarify that you have read the rest of the book that the rest of the book is not anything like this poem <laughs> so i also when i was organizing the manuscript i faced uh, you know contradictory opinions about this poem and strongly people react very strongly to this poem some would just you have to cut it out oh, wow. otherwise uh, yeah have to cut it out but i now i look at the book i feel there are many poems i would cut out um, afterthought, but that poem, <laughs> I insist, oh, it yeah. has to be, has to be in it. And um, yeah, and also, you know, speaking of statement, now that I'm thinking about, um, the poem really functions uh, on hypothesis. It's just one hypothesis after another, instead of giving any proof, or instead of giving any answers, it's asking question and elaborating the, the hypothesis, because um, and also from my recent experience, shall I just digress and talk about, well, yeah, my, uh, when I was in China, I haven't been back to China for four years because of the COVID, but last summer I had to go back and renew my visa. So I went back and it's in a totally different uh, state when the time I, I left there because of apparently the dictatorship and the uh, communist slogan just brimming the street. One of them is so beautiful. Uh, in Chinese, it's called uh, And in English translation, it's people are the rivers and mountains and the rivers and mountains are the people. And the rivers and mountains are a metonym for, mm -hmm. for, for a common metonym in China for the country or the nation. So when I look at that line, and how beautiful and how false that is. And I was just astonished. And well, if you look at that line, there are at least three methods of figurative speech playing at the same time. The first is that the syntactical structure is a chiasmus, and then it uses metaphor, and then it uses metonym. With such a short propaganda sentence, it uses you know a lot right. of literary devices and make it so beautiful to express a distorted truth. And, um, and also I think from that experience of how I was raised facing these rhetorical statements, uh, I kind of try to avoid them in my own poems and rather just ask questions because statements sometimes to me from where I from uh, became a form of suppression uh, right. almost, yeah. But I just want to mention that sentence, how, how beautiful and ridiculous wow. that is. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, that's wonderful. I mean, I feel that the metonym as well in your work, it's throughout, right? It's, mm. it's throughout this piece, I'm thinking about China as the porcelain, China um, working and again, redoubling in its meanings, um, vacating, but also moving outwards. Um, there's such slippage um, in this poem that you read, but also in the book writ large. I'm astonished that people would suggest you to take it out because yes, it is very distinct from the other poems, but I feel like it is, it just so belongs in its disobedience. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, I think, a resident Thank thread you. throughout this book. And I'm thinking of the poem Calligraphy, which was really interesting. Um, speaking of the red guards and anti-intellectualism. Mm -hmm. There is a challenging intellectualism within this poem that I think is revolutionary. 
um, that I think mm. is, you know, calling forth the frames of anxiety around intellectualism. Um, and I see that throughout this book as well with these heavy illusions of Beethoven, Mozart, Brahms. <laughs> like, yeah, a lot of references. Yeah. Now yeah. I regret, make it not as accessible oh, as it should be. But I'd love to talk <laughs> to you, you a little bit about, um, pointedly about this uh, slippage in language. So yeah. there's a moment that you read in this poem, right, that you um, call attention to English as a second language, the hypocritical, I mean, hypothetical, right? Um, which I love that slip that intentional mm -hmm. slip. Um, and I know you were writing poetry in, in before you know you were writing in English. I'm mm -hmm. wondering how you would respond to the question, what kind of agency does viewing English from a somewhat distant view as a poet lend to your perspective? Do you think you're a different poet in English? I'm very uh, um, I, And also I, I, just one more question, sorry. Mm -hmm. I love meaty questions, as you probably noticed. As well, how much do you kind of mindfully play with translation, mistranslation, in provoking kind of, you know, breaking the ways we think about the world? Mm. I I would answer the second question first because um, I used to I used to do some uh, mistranslation, but now. I don't do that anymore. And I think there are various reasons. First of all, I don't believe so much in that. I mean, the, the other poem, Hononong is the Sound of Thunder, uh, the half Chinese, half English poem. I want to play out the, the musicality of the both languages intact, just the way they are. Um, but mistranslation, I used to be very interested in it. Now, mm. I, I, now I have to think about it, but whether writing in the second language, it, I become a different poet. I think I do. I, I think I do the, this language to me because it's not my mother tongue. I have to learn it and it's so distant. It's external. It's like an object in the hand that is being materialized. It's like a Play-Doh. Play you, can, you can shape it, you can take it apart, you can... Right. Uh, form it but also I think it allows me because of this distance allows me to speak um, about some secret of myself um, that I cannot speak about in my own native language Mandarin um, so so I I think that absolutely shapes me and also at the beginning of learning how to write or how to read an English poem for a foreigner, the first thing that comes to me is always the music, uh, mm -hmm. that the music can be perceived without understanding the meaning. So I think there's another poem in the book that says um, the line, uh, because I just digress a little bit, that the sutra, some of the uh, Buddhism sutra being translated in Chinese, and they are not translated according to meaning. They're translated according to their phonetic uh, quality. And I asked a Buddhist friend and he told me that they believe it's in the music that the language has its power. Once the, English, uh, once the music is destroyed, the power is lost. It's not the meaning. So in this poem, I paraphrase my friend. He said, um, the power he insisted is in the sonnet, not in its meaning, its attachment. So when I first read English poetry, I was just transformed by music uh, spelled from Sybil's Leaves by Jared Manning Hopkins. Uh, that poem is tremendous to me. Um, and yeah, I think that really shaped me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, thank you. Um, we do have one question in the chat. Um, I'll turn to that right now. I have I have a million more questions, but I'll I'll save some space. Um, so the question is: It's unusual to find a poem that is at once a lyric poem and a narrative poem. In this case, also something like a poem of ideas. Did the balances there develop naturally, or was that part of what took those years to develop the right pacing? 
and motion among modes? Mm. Um, that's a great question. Uh, I think lyricism comes to me naturally, that I never tried to force lyricism in a poem because sometimes I feel that would be straining. And um, even though this poem has a lot of rhyme, rhymes, but I, I don't like rhymes that much. But in this poem, I think the rhyme, I hope they are assisting the flow, but also really trying to be ironic and funny. It's not serious, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a play. And, um, but the narrative really took me time to, to think about and speaking, whether it is a poem of idea, but I did try a, a long time working on that idea because I couldn't, couldn't thought it through, think it through at that age, <laughs> at that time. But the idea and the narrative took longer, but the music came, came just blindly, I think. Yeah. I think that um, I had a related question just in terms of how time works throughout your book. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about the time you spent on this poem, right? And like the length of it and the time mm -hmm. we spent together listening to it, which is such a rare feat. Um, is there any relationship between the length, the kind of maximalism of this piece and how you think about history? or resisting mm. maybe a conventional way of recollecting history. I found there were many moments in the book in which history doesn't move in conventional ways. Mm. And I'm thinking of your line, quote, without testaments, history is no more than a buried legend. I'd love to hear yeah. your thoughts on any of that on history. History, wow, that's a, also a very big subject. Um, but, <laughs> um, wow. Um, but I, I, I really think that whatever is historical should be written in the vein of the personal and whatever is personal should be written in the vein of historical. And, mm. and the, the, the task of a writer is really not to record, I mean, this poem is fictional, it's fictive. It's really not to record the history, but to amplify it. Um, right. So history does, to me does not stand as a form of fact or truth, but it's a kind of a collective consciousness that would build for, for each other to re recon reconciliate with our being. Um, but wait, what was your other question? I'm thinking about like the length of the piece. Oh like yeah. Maximalism, like was that intentional or did it come out that way? Or I just, uh, I just love how much time it takes. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Um, well, maximalism is not very welcomed nowadays, right? Uh, oh God, yeah. yeah, very unfortunate. But I always loved. I I don't know whether it was intentional, but I always loved long poems when I uh, first started reading poetry. I mean, Drunken Boats, Rambo, uh, uh, Wasteland, T. S. Eliot, uh, Seaside Cemetery, Paul Valery. Uh, Mayakovsky, I mean, all of these poets I read are long poems. And I, I'm really interested in a poem to see how the mind manifests itself. Like where's the movement of the mind? And I think there's nothing more intimate than that, even though it is so cold as you think about it, you're, you know, but it's, you're not sharing what you had for breakfast with me. That would be another form of intimacy, but sharing of the mind and, showing how the mind stumbles and becomes vulnerable in its process when it's unfolding. I think that's what excites me. And therefore, I was more interested in longer poems in my first book, but recently I'm writing much shorter poems <laughs> uh, to catch up the trend, you know? <laughs> the fashion. See, write, write more maximalist, excessive lengthy poems, it's, it's startling. Um, I think also to your point, I feel that while there's a kind of interesting flatness, fictitiousness, mm -hmm. I do think there's a testament with buried within this poem. It feels, I can, 
And I just want to lock into that anecdote that you shared earlier because I can feel that rage, that testimony of rage, even if it's not uttered. Um, mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's so powerful and moves it beyond a, a type of kind of masturbatory nihilism. Mm. Better words. That's beautifully um, put. <laughs> we have one more question in the chat or in the Q&A box. And it is um, by Sai, S-I, S-Y. Will you ever go back to write a poem in Chinese in the future? Um, perhaps do you, do you continue to write um, poetry in Chinese? Is the decision determined by the consideration of audience, readers, or the feeling of becoming a different poet? Uh, that's a great question. Uh... Earlier in my life, I, I would say I always desire to go back to China and write in Chinese. But really, I think the um, writing in whatever language you choose to write in really depends on the environment uh, you're living in. I find really disconnected with Chinese, uh, even though I speak it every day. But I, you know, there's no, I cannot receive anything. And that's been difficult. The same thing happened to me when I was in China and there is no English. And I have a friend who's a wonderful poet, uh, Yuki Tanaka, who's Japanese. And uh, he's now a professor uh, in Tokyo, went back to Japan, but he struggled to write in English. Um, I think that's, that's the thing. But also I consider less about the audience, to be honest. I, if I choose to write in Chinese again, in poetry, I write essays and other things in Chinese, but probably you're right, becoming a different poet would be the main cause, main motivation, yeah. That's fascinating. I wanna ask you um, maybe a personal question and then move on to hearing what you're working on uh, while we close out the session. Thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. Um, so, so much of your poem as well as this book writ large. Again, if you haven't purchased a copy of this, I really, really recommend it. Bearing the Mountain, Copper Canyon, get it, get your Thank copy, you. get your copy yesterday. Um, so much of this book involves um, physical wanderings. Um, can you tell me about a place that you've been, mm. that you've visited? It might be sensational or it might be mundane that for some reason sticks with you at this moment and why? At this moment, um, place in the world. It could be, yeah, any, any yeah. Place, boring or sensational. Sensational, I'd say uh, Istanbul. I, I, I went there a few years ago with a bunch of my friends and it was my first time there. It was, it was magical, uh, but I tried to write about it, but I couldn't, uh, you know, couldn't. <laughs> With my words, I fail to match that uh, beauty of that place. But also, I think that that's often we go to travel and we look at the photos online and everything. We have a high expectation we, and then we're disappointed. But th Istanbul doesn't sink that way. And it is different from my expectation, but it kind of lives par a parallel life with my expectation and imagination of that place. Um, so that's a place that I've been to and I feel I've never been to it. It's, it was like a dream. Right. And I think I will try to write about it uh, in future, but I don't think I can now. Are you more it's, of a solo traveler or do you, um, I'm, do you rove with herds? Uh, when I was in college, I, I still had friends. So I rove with herds. Now I'm friendless. I just travel <laughs> alone. <laughs> I will say estrangement and, and kind of disillusionment also factor pretty heavily in this book. <laughs> uh, I love yeah. also um, the note at the end um, of the book about your name, a mythologic, which means a mythological one-legged bird whose dance brought forth rain and flood. Yes, it's, it's, tr it's true. Beautiful. Wow. Thank you. Um, yeah, that, that was such a nice note to end on in terms of completing the book. Thank you. Do you feel that that rings true? Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know, because that's been uh, the fact of my life uh, for 
for however long I live. And because that, that came because of my father's superstition about, you know, the five elements during China. And I was told when I was born that um, the time, days, year I was born, I lack water in my life. Oh, wow. And so my father made my name into a rainbow in hope that it will bring the water in my life. And uh, magically, I think most of my poems are sticking to water, the image of water and the, the, the sense of fluidity and malleability of it. Um, but well, yeah, that's, that's, that's uh, how, how, how that happened, my name. Uh, what are you working on? What are you working on next? What you got going on? What are you cooking? Uh, uh, that's a great question that I'm terrified and unable to answer because whenever I, you are a great writer too, like whenever we're wor working on stuff, we're in the midst uh, of something and we can't really like stretching our hand, we can't really see our palm. So um, I think I'm working on shorter poems have stylistically that the language is much plainer, simpler, and trying to show the structure or the bone of the mind mm -hmm. without a flourish. So mm -hmm. I'm work trying to work on that, but I write very slowly. Um, so I have no idea what it's like yet. Well, I can't wait. I can't wait to read read it whenever. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you for speaking with us. Um, thank you so much. We're, yes, we're nearly out of time. Um, yeah, thank you for this wonderful conversation. I appreciate you, Chengling. I appreciate this invitation and your wonderful questions. Thank you, Jessica. And taking the poem, I still can't believe it. <laughs> thank you. Please, there was, there was no doubt. <clears throat> Thank you both so much. Um, how wonderful to just kind of sit with one poem in this way and see see what emerges from it. Thank you. Thank you for that experience. Um, and thanks to our hosts, Brookline Booksmith, um, to the one wonderful Cynthia Ayeza for her presence in the chat, um, and to the generous continued support we receive from the National Endowment for the Arts, the Mass Cultural Council, and of course, Boston University. Um, and finally, thanks to all of you for being here tonight and for making Agni a part of your literary life. Um, we hope to see you at our next virtual event on Monday, June 20th, um, with editor-at-large Julia Brown and fiction writer Sarah Micah. And have a good night, everyone. Thank you.